Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntris here. Um, earlier today, I presented my writing shotgun with Jeff Loeb conversation from November of 2005. Uh, now we move on to 2007 with another fun talk with Jeff. And this time it was uh, while he was uh, waiting to uh, board a plane. So he's sitting in the terminal, I'm talking on the phone, and we had a great conversation. Uh, Civil War had just come out, and uh, uh, one of the miniseries that Jeff had following Civil War was Fallen Sun, so it was a pleasure talking to him about that. Uh, Originally, this was presented as a uh, two-part, two-episode podcast, but I'm giving you uh, all of this conversation in one schmear. So I hope you enjoy this talk with uh, Jeff Loeb, live in the airport from 2007, on today's uh, second reprint of Word Balloon. Word Balloon is brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Look, Aftershock has been a longtime sponsor of Word Balloon. It's greatly appreciated, but also I love the fact that they give so many friends of Word Balloon uh, the opportunity to make great new original books, like There's Something Wrong with Patrick Todd from Ed Brisson and Gavin Guidry. That series debuts this month from Aftershock Comics. There's also Astronaut Down from James Patrick and Rubin, uh, also debuting this month. Ron Mars and Marcos Castillo brought us Almost American. The complete series is now collected, and uh, that trade paperback has also dropped from Aftershock Comics. Also, Cullen Bunn and Heath Amodio bring a brand new story to Aftershock the Heathens. As you know, Cullen's been a great Aftershock creator. Lots of great supernatural and crime stuff from Cullen and other genres as well. That's the great thing about Aftershock Comics. So many great genres beyond superhero stories. Not that they ignore superheroes, but really give you a full breadth of uh, genre fiction in all accounts. Whether it's western, sci-fi, supernatural, crime, horror, everything. You could find it at Aftershock Comics. Go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages of art, and the diamond codes on how to order these books through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. This episode of Word Balloon is brought to you by AlexRossArt.com. Coming up in the later part of the summer or early fall, from Abrams and Marvel, it's Fantastic Four, Full Circle, written and illustrated by Alex Ross. It's a rainy night in Manhattan. Not a creature is stirring except for the thing, Ben Grimm. When an intruder suddenly appears inside the Baxter building, the Fantastic Four find themselves surrounded by a swarm of invading parasites. These creatures, composed of negative energy, come to Earth using a human host as a delivery system, but why? Fantastic Four has no choice but to journey into the negative zone. Great story, uh, great creator, as you know, Alex Ross. uh, Really excited for this project. He's been working on it for a really long time. And, uh, man, you are in for some spectacular images. And if you want to get a preview for this, all you need to do is go to Alex's website, alexrossart.com. It's there also, as always, amazing paintings, uh, sketches, lithographs, posters, every price point, epic images. You know the name. Check it out, alexrossart.com. Word Balloon is brought to you by my listeners. You are the sponsors of Word Balloon, the League of Word Balloon listeners, via subscriptions monthly to Patreon, patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Hey, couldn't do it without you, honestly, League. I, I truly appreciate your support. I appreciate your devotion, your listenership, and your patronage, honestly. Um, you know, if you can even spare a dollar a month, it's greatly appreciated. It helps me make these terrific shows, uh, go to conventions where I'm not sponsored, and, uh, you know, keep networking and, and uh, making interesting programming, hope, hopefully for you to enjoy every month here on Word Balloon. But I couldn't do it without you. Thank you very much, League of Word Balloon listeners. Again, if you want to subscribe to Word Balloon uh, for as little as a dollar a month, all you need to do is go to patreon.com slash word balloon, W-O-R-D-B-A-L-L-O-O-N. And again, I really appreciate your patronage, subscription, and attention, all of you, the League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is brought to you by Aw Yeah Comics. You know the imprint, you know the stores. There's three locations for Aw Yeah Comics. In suburban Chicago, Skokie, Illinois. In New York, in Harrison, New York. And in Indiana, in Muncie, Indiana. All three stores have a big online presence. 
They have Facebook groups and they do live online sales every week and give you reviews of the latest books. So make sure you go to their website, allyeahcomics.com slash our locations, and it will give you the links. Oh Yeah Comics, a great resource to find new books and pick up your old favorites as well. Make sure you head to their website, allyeahcomics.com, and go to those locations and make sure you watch those online auctions they have every week. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. This is John Suntress. Today, we speak with writer Jeff Lowe about his current work at Marvel Comics, including work on the characters Wolverine, The Ultimates, and a new miniseries spinning out of the events of the death of Captain America, Fallen Sun. Last week, Marvel Comics upended the comic book world and even had non-comic readers taking note of the death of Captain America. While Ed Brubaker is pulling the strings of Cap's own book, writer Jeff Loeb has the task of telling the story of the rest of the Marvel heroes reacting in Fallen Sun, the death of Captain America. In this episode of Word Balloon, we'll talk about Fallen Sun and also get a look at Jeff's input in the Marvel event Civil War. But before we get started, Jeff had a request to put a personal message at the beginning of our conversation. I, I have to shout out to Jesse Alexander, my partner in crime over at Heroes, because he's a huge fan, not only of comics, but of word balloon and he came into my office like two weeks ago this was just before you got in touch with me so I, when you first got in touch with me i sort of thought maybe jesse put you up to it and he said he said what are you gonna do another word balloon and i was like what and he said what are you gonna do another word balloon and i said i don't know i mean i you know i just did something on newsarama and he goes no, I didn't ask you that. And I said, uh, I, I think I'm on fanboy radio sometime soon. And he goes, okay, look, all that stuff's great, but it's not Word Balloon, okay? And I and I like listening to Word Balloon. And I was like, okay, dude, uh, calm down. Don't, don't lose what little hair you got left. Uh, I, if, if it seems like a good idea, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll talk to the Word Balloon guy. Thanks. <laughs> but he kind of stormed out of my office, and I was like sitting there going, what was all that about? Wow. And then, literally, like three days later, you called. Uh, <laughs> and so I I have not told him that I'm doing this. So I really kind of want to let you just put it out there. Uh, and I don't, you know, there's part of me that sort of wants this to start off the story so that just as soon as he starts listening to it, he's going, What? What? Oh, my! <laughs> Thanks for the indulgence and for those listening, including Jesse Alexander. There'll be more talk about Heroes and how Jesse and Jeff work together on the show Heroes in part two of our conversation. But for part one, it has its own uniqueness as well. If you're a fan of Word Balloon, you'll know that my original conversation with Jeff Loeb took place as he was on his usual Los Angeles commute from his home to the law studios where he went to go to work. And it was a great time uh, being there, driving with Jeff, and it turned out to be a very fun conversation. This time we started literally as Jeff was leaving WonderCon, going back home from San Francisco to Los Angeles. So our conversation begins in the cab ride. Then we go to the terminal at the San Francisco airport. And then finally things do start to settle down. And in the second half of the conversation, we are in Jeff's home and in the Heroes offices where we talk a little bit more about Jeff's Marvel books. Given your past with other Marvel stories, all the color stories, Spider-Man Blue yeah. and, and, and the Hulk and, and Daredevil Yellow, not only because of what you went through with your son, but also your time away, are you re-energized and do you see these characters in a new way than your last tenure at Marvel? Uh, that's not, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I think okay. that I, you know, passion for these characters is as strong as it ever did. It certainly, it's, it's, it's fresh because it's not like I'm working on my 30th issue of, of Superman Batman. Sure. Um, where the challenge there is to continue to make it interesting. But, yes, it's exciting. It's you know, a number of levels to me because these are characters that I, a lot of the voices I've never done before. Certainly a lot of the Avengers, there's Marvel, Spider-Woman, characters that Bendis has brought back from the 1970s and the 80s that, that I, you know, I just never wrote because I wasn't part of that group. So there's that element to it. And then the second side of it is, is like, you know, Reneal and, and Cassidy and and, uh, and Ramita were all guys. I mean, when Kasana and I first started talking about coming over there, 
that was part of his pitch. And I was like, you know, well, I'll just bring my own men and that'll be fine. But, <laughs> but secretly, you know, of course I wanted to work with these guys. I'm now at the airport. Okay, do you want to um, do you want to stop here and uh... let's stop here because we're we're not in mid question. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> I will I will call you probably in about 15 minutes. Okay, very uh, good. Because uh, this guy actually means to hear in no time at all. Nice going. Well, yeah. My guess is we'll have you know 20 minutes of this, and then I'm gonna have to go, and uh, I'll be down on the ground, and <laughs> I got all kinds of time. I, mean, I don't know what your schedule is like, but that's fine. Though. We'll keep going. Uh, I'll, I'll only tell you this that for whatever reasons. Fortune has decided to, to to smile down on me. I am currently sitting in the terminal, and directly across from me are three Playboy playmates looking at their centerfolds in their own Playboy magazine. Life I wouldn't have good. known they were Playboy playmates except for the fact that they're looking at pictures of themselves and pointing to themselves and showing them to each other in daily. Beats looking at like you know Len Wein or somebody like that in the terminal as you're flying back. Uh, you said that I didn't say. That. I, I like Len Wein. And, I, and that's a good transition for me because I wanted to ask you about the backup story in Wolverine 50. Where did the idea come from to play with the original dialogue of that uh, initial meeting of the Hulk and Wolverine? Uh, well, it was you know, supposed to be an anniversary issue. And when you're dealing with Ed McGinnis, you have to sort of begin with who are these two guys going to fight. It doesn't matter what two guys or what book you're working on. You're starting with that idea. Uh, since I'm doing Wolverine, the character that he's most associated with in the Marvel Universe as opposed to his own cast just the Hulk. And I just had this idea, which was that he's having all these flashbacks in terms of, you know, what was going on in his life. And would it be interesting to relive his first experience with present-day memories? And that's where it began. You have that great shocking ending. Was it just meant to be an interlude? Or is this, you know, going to lead to something else uh, down the road in your run? It does raise interesting questions, doesn't it? Okay. Um, <laughs> you can leave it at that if you want to. I think that's what we'll do. Okay. I think the thing that was sort of confusing to me was the number of people who wrote to me and said, why did I pay homage, basically, to this scene that took place in Ultimate Hulk versus Ultimate Wolverine? Mm -hmm. I was like, it's not an homage. I mean, look at who's in the picture. It's not exactly the same thing. Wolverine's reaction to it indicates that it's not an homage. He's remembering something that, theoretically, he shouldn't be able to remember. So we'll leave it at that. Okay. Has the idea of Wolverine getting his memories back, like, open this door for you in terms of characterization, where he really is dealing with this flood of, you know, new memories that he can't trust himself, even though that might be the truth? I inherited it. So, from my point of view... It was an avenue of storytelling that could work with what I wanted to do. I knew that the Sabretooth Wolverine story that I was telling was going to encompass a lot of history because these two characters have a lot of history. Um, what would be the most efficient way to be able to do flashbacks and memories and memory backs and dream backs that would marry themselves to the character? And because he was going through this very early stage of having a flood of memories, it was sort of the right thing at the right time. But the story I was going to tell is a story that I'm telling. It just gave a more compelling reason as to how it could happen. Uh, that's me getting on the plane. Oh, okay. Call me on my yeah, I'll, call you, I'll call you when I get down. All right, sounds good, and, man. And, and all I can tell you is these girls are really cute. And I work with really cute girls. <laughs> Yes, you Katie do. Katie Panettiere and Clay Larder are really cute girls. These are really cute girls. I hope I didn't, like, screw up your street cred by having you talk about Hulk and Wolverine while, you know. Well, you know what? They can't hear me. All right. Good deal. Okay. <laughs> when we did wrap up last time, you were telling me that I had gotten your timing of joining Marvel wrong because uh, I thought you had joined kind of near the end of when Civil War had been put together. Just sort of to begin, when I came to Marvel, I pretty much had everything planned out. I was going to do... 24 issues of Ultimates mm -hmm. uh, with Joe Matt and Ed McGinnis and um, breaking it sort of the way we did Superman, Batman in different arcs and 12 issues of at least a Spider-Man story. We didn't know where it was going to appear with J. Scott Campbell. Some project with Mike Turner, which turned out to be the Ultimate Wolverine origin. And I was pretty happy hanging out in the Ultimate Universe. Uh, Spidey wasn't going to be that, but I also knew that Spidey was going to be ways down the road, given 
how long it was going to take Jeff to do the artwork. But that was the only reason I was brought over. Uh, you know, Joe Casada has always had a great deal of respect for me as a storyteller. And one of the things that I like doing, and one of the things that I do regularly uh, in television, uh, is, you know, just kick around stories. And we were back east at, at what was going to be my first uh, retreat uh, on my contract. And uh, everyone was going around and they were pitching their ideas. And uh, Ben just had this idea. And I really should point out that out of everybody there, I think it's safe to say that other than Joe Q, Ben is, is really the architect of what happens in the Marvel Universe just because he thinks like that and he's been there long enough in order to do that. And, uh, certainly in a post-House of M world, he's established himself as the person with the big idea. He had this idea that the Avengers would be involved in something and S.H.I.E.L.D. would put together an elite task force and try to hunt them down. And, you know, immediately my story spider sense is going off. <laughs> I don't have the same fondness for S.H.I.E.L.D. that other people do. And I think they're great secondary characters, but if somebody's going to go after the Avengers and hunt them down, wouldn't it be cooler if it was other Avengers? Uh, and we started talking about you know, a way of turning the Marvel Universe against itself. And that's when Millar said that he had been watching a lot of documentaries on the American Civil War and that he was trying to figure out how to do a story called, in his mind, Brother Against Brother. Uh, and out of that, sort of us pitching back and forth, grew Civil War. I was sort of decided then that Mark would write it. Brian had his hands full, and I really didn't have a whole lot of interest in doing something that large. I knew the kind of time commitment. I mean, it, it completely consumed what Mark has done for the last year. So part of my role at Marvel is to be someone who can help with those things. And, you know, I, J. Michael Straczynski has the same kind of role as well. He just has, we just refer to him as Zeus throwing <laughs> lightning bolts down at us <laughs> to explain to us what we should be doing while Mark, Brian, and I are running around like idiots. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when it came around to Cap uh, and Iron Man and, uh, and the, the end of Civil War and all those characters, we had to start figuring out what the next phase was going to be. And we knew what was going to happen at the end of the war and that they were going to lose this hero. And, mm -hmm. and that led back to the story that I was telling before and how I got pulled into doing Fallen Sun. And that really was the first thing I've done since I've been there that has grown out of someone else's idea and at the same time exists on its own. When uh, I came over, there were there are a few stories that I still want to tell. I haven't quite figured out how to do that. One of them was this reconciling the relationship between Wolverine and Sabretooth. Mm -hmm. And Kasana knew that I had that story in mind. And we just both agreed that if the right artist came along, you know, in my mind, I was doing it with Andy Kubert, but Andy was no longer going to be at Marvel. Right. Um, so I just put it on the back burner. And so when he called and said that Simone was interested in going on Wolverine, I, I knew that I could do that story. Um, and I could actually do it a little more the way I wanted to, in that it would be have a little more grid in it. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I, I, Andy... Uh, is a brilliant artist, but tends to draw what I would say is pretty. Yes. Uh, and and I think that's great. I don't. That's not a criticism. That's you know, I would love to work with Andy. Uh, but once I knew that Simone was on there, 
the level of violence and, and the savagery that we could get into just opened up a better version of the story. And believe me, it's you ain't seen nothing yet. Well, that's great. I mean, yeah, uh, when, when you got when you got half of Wolverine's face ripped off and he's still fighting, I thought that was pretty cool to begin with. So uh. Uh, it, that was just something that that I just kept thinking about. You know, it, it in some ways was kind of inspired by the Marvel zombies. But I, you know, I just kept thinking about you know, what it would be like if two guys were fighting on a jet plane and they blew up and they just kept fighting. Uh, and and the, you know, the, the skin would be on fire and stuff. And So, yeah, I mean, sometimes sort of cool images lead you to a place where you can get in the story. Uh, particularly when you're, you're telling a story which is about two people who want to kill each other. It's trying to come up with things that are hopefully visually exciting uh, so that it's not repetition of what's going on. Do you mind recounting the story and, and explaining how the assignment, you know, was created? We have these creative retreats. Uh, and this one happened to be around Christmas time. So it, it obviously, it being the beginning of March right now, this came together incredibly fast, uh, which is one of the things that I really like about working at Marvel, uh, that something like this could get put together. On the first day, there's like 40 people in this room. Uh, there's, it's a handful of creators. This particular one, uh, it was me and Bendis and Dan Slott and, uh, most importantly, J. Michael Straczynski. Um, I'm sure there were other people, and I'm sorry if I forgot met some of you were there. Was Brubaker there? He was not. Okay. That was sort of the joke. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, the idea was and I mean this with all thought, that any time anyone went to the, to the bathroom, we would then make a suggestion for their book and and then try to fuck them up any way that we could. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. You're all um, absolutely allowed to say that. And so, uh, but it's, you know, it's just a joke. Um, but the idea was is that, you know, every time we had a big idea, you could see Brevoort, who's Brubaker's editor, you know, the, the the veins in his head would just get bigger because he knew what Brew had in mind and wanted to make sure that none of this was screwing up what Brew was doing. Okay. Um, and believe me, if any of it did, we would have unraveled it all. Um, but we were going around the room and and what happens is each of the editors talks about each of their books and you have to kind of know Tom Brevoort and that's that he's you know uh, he has two modes which is he's mild mannered Tom Brevoort and then he's blast out a living bomb burst when when you hit on something that might change continuity okay uh, so you know he stood on the bridge and had to be convinced that that Wolverine and Spidey could join the Avengers. He was in the stone of the bridge and, and uh, had to be convinced that bringing back Bucky was a good idea. So he's really sort of our BS detector. Okay. Uh, he's been there. Move his way. I think he's the only guy that remembers that I once worked on cable and X Force. <laughs> uh, and I adore Tom. Uh, so he's, you know, reading through his list of the 93 books that he has, most of which are with Bendis. Right. And he gets around to Captain America, and he says, you know, in, in Captain America 24, uh, Captain America finds the Serpent Crown, or whatever it was, uh, and then in Captain America 25, Cap dies, and then in Captain America 26, it's the Falcon and, and when it shoulders react, and I went, whoa, whoa, hang on, stop! What do you mean Cap dies? And, like, everyone in the room suddenly looked at me, and, I, and, like, I'm the idiot. And it's because I missed a summit. I was at the Civil War summit, and I, there was sort of a summit in between, and then there was this one. And uh, everyone looked at me and said, yeah, uh, well, that's what happens after Civil War. And I said, no, 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 no hang on a second. I remember Cap getting wounded, uh, but he's die-dying? And everyone in the room says, yeah, die-dying. Die it's already written and drawn. I was like, wow, so what are we doing? And everyone 
what do you mean? And I said, um, this is death of Superman, guys. This is every media outlet. This is newspapers. This is Joe Goes Back on Stephen Colbert stuff. Like, are, are we... Is every book going to have a black shield on it? Are we doing World Without Cap? Are we doing <laughs> the funeral? What are we doing? And everyone in the room was like, oh, it's interesting. Really? Because it really was going to be... The I feeling was that after Civil War, that to have another event maybe wasn't what should be done. Yeah. Um, and again, I wasn't there for the decision, so I couldn't have said this months before. Um, so that's when both Casada and Buckley were like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't know. I, you know, put a... If, if all this is happening just in Cap and Avengers, because Bendis actually is, is dealing with it, sure. I, and I don't, I don't know that the Fantastic Four or any of the other books need to come to a grinding halt. But, right. Uh, but there ought to be something that I don't know whether or not it's a mini series. I don't, I don't know what it is that sort of takes a moment for the Marvel Universe to reflect on what's going on. Um, and you know, a bunch of ideas get batted around, and then all of a sudden. You gotta understand at these retreats that JMS speaks two, three times a day, and when he does, <laughs> it's Zeus throwing down lightning bolts. It's, okay. it's not going to be, you know, some stupid idea that I've come up with because uh, <laughs> I'm just talking my mouth off. If you can actually imagine that, Dennis and I just spend the entire time going, "That's a stupid idea. That's a stupid idea. That's a stupid idea," uh, and JMS. And I remember he's holding a yellow pad in his hand, reading it off. And he says, it's five issues. The five stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally, acceptance. And the moment he said it, I knew exactly what it was. Uh, I, and I sort of picked up the ball. And started to run with it, and I, you know, and I said, I, the first one is Wolverine, and and his, his denial because he doesn't believe the cap is dead, and he's going to want to find proof. Uh, and the second one is anger, and it's the Avengers, and they're pissed off about what's happening, and they take it out on some poor schlub who didn't know what was going on, and they're beating his brains in. Uh, and it's bargaining, and that's you know, the focus on. Captain America, and should there be another Captain America, and, and the fourth one is depression, and the only person you could do that with is Spidey. <laughs> uh, and then it's acceptance, and the acceptance falls on on Iron Man and Tony, because it, he's the one who has to go the furthest. Uh, and and I and I said, and, and then we need to get, like, the greatest artist ever to do this. And uh, at that point, I can see David Bogart, who's in charge of scheduling. He's like hitting his calculator, and like smoke's coming out of it, and he's trying to figure all this out. As I'm going, look, if we're going to do Wolverine, it's got to be with Lanil because he's like, as far as I'm concerned, he's the most exciting guy prior to Simone Bianchi to draw this character. So that's who's got to be. Uh, and it's too bad if he's drawing you with interest. <laughs> uh, but the thing about Lenny is so fast, he can do two books in a month, so uh, no one's worried. Okay. Uh, and I said, and I think we can pull McGinnis out of Ultimates because we're ahead, uh, and he should do the Avengers because it's got to be big and it's got to be like Superman, Batman with a million characters running around and let him design the hell out of it and it'll be fabulous. Uh, for the Captain America one, I, I am determined to, to do a much more comprehensive Captain America story one, one day, and it's got to be with J.R. J.R., John Romita Jr., because I can see his cap in my mind um, because I know he's drawn every hero in the universe, but he's never done a cap story, like a formal cap story where cap is the lead. Uh, and so, and J.R. is also fast enough that he could do two books because he's on World War Hulk. Um, and, and then I said, and look, I have no idea where where Finch is on on Moon Knight and 
someone says, well, he's wrapping it up. And I said, well, do you know what he's doing next? And no, it's, we need to find something. And I was like, great. You know, we need... Because I know that he loves Spidey and that he wants to draw Spidey. So this is a chance for him to do that. Uh, and, and you know, I don't know one of the rooms sort of, well, it's kind of making sense. Yeah, yeah, it could happen. Uh, and, and then I said, and now I'm going to make everyone's head explode. And that is, if we're going to do the last one, it's going to have the whole Marvel Universe. And we're going to need Cassidy. And then sort of Paul falls out the room. And I said, look, I, I understand that, you know, he's doing what he's doing. And I, and I know that Astonishing is a huge commitment. But come on. I mean, he's the biggest cat fan in the world. If we're going to legitimize this, we need him. And on that one, everyone was like, well, we'll see. And sure. And Cassidy turned to me and said, if we do this, you're going to have to go to Jaws. Because you guys are friends, and we're not asking him. So I was like, oh, get off me. Uh, and then there was, you know, some more machinations that had to go on backstage in order to sort of make it happen and, you know, schedules and my own schedule with heroes. Uh, and they're concerned about whether or not I was going to be able to do it. And, and when could we do this? And what did that mean to Cap 25? And, and again, you know, the universe has a way of sort of responding to the right thing, maybe. Uh, or at least as a sense of humor, and I don't get the joke. Um, and that is that McNiven was late, or Millar was late, whoever was late, on Civil War 7. So you couldn't do Cap 25 until 7 came out. They were determined to get 7 out by the time the New York Con was happening. That was going to happen. And so that meant that Cap got moved into March. Once that happened, the Cap moved into March, because 26 takes place at the same time as some of these stories, then Fall and Sun fell into April. And then we started thinking, okay, so we could have two in April and we could have three in May. But that meant I had to write five scripts at once. Wow. Not like what I normally do, which is I write a script, I wait six weeks, I wait till my artist gets to about page 15, and then I write the next script. Because okay. I simply don't have the time. Sure. Um, so this is during Christmas break, and I'm sitting there going, oh, piece of cake. Uh, you know, I'm not going back until January 3rd. It's now December 19th. I'll write all five during that time. Yeah, well, it, <laughs> it wasn't going to happen that way. But what I did do is I took some time off, and I sat with my yellow pad, and and I broke all of the stories, which is really, for me, the hardest part, which is sort of beating out what was going to happen in all of them, and that I had. So then it was just about stealing, you know, weekends and late nights and and. Keeping Up with Wolverine and, and Onslaught Reborn, which are the ones that are ongoing right now. Mm -hmm. um, and those are winding down. So, you know, pretty soon either I have to find something else to do or I'm writing a lot of Ultimate scripts that will be drawn eventually, um, which I can do. Uh, and and this, trust me, even though I'm saying it this way... <laughs> It's going to bite me on the nose at any point. Because <laughs> uh, one of these guys just, you know, uh, it happened on on, uh, on the last issue of Ultimate. Was that all of a sudden, Joe drew six pages in a week. And was like, okay, I'm done. Wow. <laughs> I was like, uh, listen, I, you know, I kind of thought we had three more weeks here. Um, so I'm sure one of them is going to pop. Um, <laughs> you know, Jessica Campbell's very close to finishing an issue with his uh, uh, Spider-Man. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a script that's needed there. Um, but, in the meantime, my immediate responsibility was to follow time. Uh, and then, you know, they managed to, to pull all the guys together. I did speak to Joss, and Joss's attitude was, if Cassidy wants to do it, then that's okay. I'll, I'll make room. Uh, and that took its own particular kind of planning. But again, I can't really stress enough that Casada and Buckley and David Bogart um, just went after this wholeheartedly. I mean, it was it, by the time we got to the first of the year, they had found everybody to make this book happen uh, on the schedule, what it was going to look like, how who was going to design it, the people that I wanted on my team. Um, it was just one of those things. And then, you know, we started it at the first of the year. And the other thing that we had to work together with was with David Gabriel, who does the, uh, the 
previews. He's the marketing guy. Okay. And so we couldn't say <laughs> what this book is called, which sure. is Fallen Sun, The Death of Captain America. And so we all agreed that we would call it Civil War Fallen Sun, um, which was accurate. Uh, right. And just be vague and let both the readers, who you know now have this ability to look three or four months ahead, particularly online, um, which, you know, when I was reading comics growing up, all, all you got was in the back near Stan's soapbox what was selling that month. Yep. Uh, and so it's really hard to keep a secret like this. And it, it somehow kept. I have no idea how it held. I have no idea how we managed to, to keep Cap's death out of the mainstream media. Um, but the night before uh, last Wednesday, uh, again, it's one of the things that I kind of marvel at, pun intended. Uh, they lined everything up, and the story broke. And, of course, you hope, with, when you're doing something like this, that the Pope doesn't die that morning. Sure. Or that we go into Iran. Uh, because <laughs> if that happens, we're on page 23 and nobody really knows. Absolutely. Um, and we had, in all fairness, a slow news day, uh, followed by a slow news day. So the media made this the biggest story ever. Uh, and that's pretty great. Uh, I think it's particularly great for Brubaker, uh, who's, you know, carried that book on his back, and now he gets a chance to try to shine and have people read his work. And that's kind of what this is all about at the end of the day. You, you want as many people reading your stuff as possible. Uh, and, and Fallen Sun is, is coming together uh, in a way that makes me very happy. Um, the idea of doing the five stages of grief that JMS graciously handed up uh, was something that because of my own experience with my son is something that I'm very much aware of. Mm -hmm. um, I can't speak to it as any kind of authority, and I can't speak to it as, as whether or not it's accurate and, oh, well, as soon as you finish anger, you move right into bargaining. Um, but I certainly understood it, and I certainly understood how these characters could talk about what was happening. Uh, and I really felt like it that I was the best person to tell this story um, for the wrong reasons. Yep. Uh, I'm, I, I hate being able to say that. Sure. Uh, but I, I've got to put it out somehow. Uh, and if that's the way it's going to come out of me, then that's the way it's going to come out of me. Uh, I haven't really written about my son's death with the exception of the small backup story that I did with Tim Sale and, and Superman Batman 26. Absolutely. Um, which I wrote 10 days after my son passed, and I still think is one of the best things that I've done and, and speaks to the power of comics and the talent of Tim Sale's illustrations. Uh, and, of course, I can't read without crying. Um, yeah. And there's, there's some moments like that that are in this, but I also wanted to tell a story that was entertaining as well because I knew that this wasn't just a, a miniseries for the fan men. This was going to be something that mainstream press was going to read and that you, you had to sort of have an understanding as to who these people were. And it's hard. It's hard not to get all tangled up in you know, who everybody is. Um, and so that, that's the challenge. The challenge is to be able to, you know, hand Fallen Sun over to somebody and have them go, oh, okay, I, I kind of know who these guys are. Um, and then the guys that are drawing it are, they're really, it's funny because I've talked separately to them, with the exception of uh, J.R.J.R. because he has nothing to prove. Um, 
they all wanted this to be like their best work. They 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 want because they're looking like, well, this is going to co- get collected with those four other schmoes, and <laughs> I got to make sure that people don't go. Wow, it's really great. There's four of them put their heart in it, and there's one guy decided to hack it in. Uh, not to say any of them would do that, but if we are under a deadline pressure, and you do do shortcuts, and sure. and uh, but these guys are total total pros, and so and they have some lead time, and uh, you know it's still March, and uh, you know the guys that are doing the April books are in April. Uh, I'm sorry, in in, in May, and. Uh, uh, I think it's really good. And I don't say that about a lot of things up front. Um, I usually let it lay on the artist until someone reads the story. Uh, but he said, like. That's cool. The, um, were you at DC during Death of Superman? I know, I can't remember the chronology of Challenger. No, I wasn't. So. Um, at that point, um, I really wasn't in comics. Um, this is sort of like between 91 and 94. Four, I had done uh, uh, the child story, mm-hmm. and then I really didn't do anything. Um, I, I guess I'd done maybe one of the. I think in '93 was when the was when the first uh, Halloween special came out. Um, but you know, if you're if you're over in Archie Goodwin land doing Legends of the Dark Knight, you're not interfacing with anybody. Right. But I, I, I actually know that that's the case because of the, the disagreement that I had had with Mike Carlin over Challengers had basically, I don't want to say I was blacklisted, but I certainly was not invited to do anything. And it was that Christmas uh, during the reign of Superman, which would have been the end of 93, okay. that I was at the Christmas party that was out here uh, at Warner Brothers, and they flew out a bunch of guys from the, from the East Coast. And at that party, Carlin came over and said, how would you like to write the Action Comics Annual for next year? And that's when the ice broke and thought, and then I could work anywhere I wanted to. I didn't know anybody at Marvel. Um, and it wasn't until the Batman thing came out that the people at Marvel called and asked whether or not I wanted to work in the X-Men office. So that's that's kind of the time period okay. uh, that, that we were in. Uh, I was so thrilled to do the action annual until I found out that it didn't have Superman in it. <laughs> that it had to be with the Eradicator. Ooh, that was great. Uh, <laughs> So, um, but you know, you do those things. Um, you know, it's one of the things that I, I try to tell writers that are breaking in. You know, I, I was whether it's arrogant or foolish or hopeful. Uh, you know, when I wanted to do my first comic book story, I wanted it to be Superman or Batman. Sure. Uh, and you know, they don't give you those first time out of the box. <laughs> they kind of got to know that you can actually do this. Uh, and so, you know, I didn't even know who the challenge of the unknown were when I when when I accepted the assignment. That's uh, why. And I picked them because they were on the list. Uh, and I had to go out and I read the entire run and I was like, boy, I got my work cut out for me. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. It's, okay. I, would, I had wondered if you had maybe, in, in you know, doing anything for Fall and Son, if you went back and saw how DC handled, you know, that whole post-Superman death. No, I, I, I actually, I think... The, having kind of my memory of it is is probably better I uh, than going back and taking a look at it. And that, sure. You know, Tom Brevoort is sort of the univac of, of comics, and I'm sure he could probably tell me every line and every panel of every book that's ever been published. So that if I happen to bump into something, so he, he's not going to let any of that get by. Well, I'm, I'm curious, and, I, and not to even tease what's happening in your story, but based on the real world um, reaction to Cap's death and the the various political editorials that sprang from it, or the you know television and radio pundits that had their chance from parodies with Stephen Colbert to like you know real grist for people like Sean Hannity and Michael Medved and 
some of the you know real conservatives out there and stuff. And I, I just wondered if you, you found that interesting, the, the various perceptions of how they read this symbolic death. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just look at it from the point of view that he lived, Steve lived his life as a hero. Uh, it's what he wanted, it's what he dreamed of, and uh, his death, uh, as it is with any good individual, uh, is a tragedy, and the best thing you can do in that regard is to celebrate their life. Uh, and the fact that different people want to make hay out of it, great. Um, it's still comics. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I'm much more interested in how the Avengers feel about this than uh, how some conservative radio pundit decides to spin the story. <laughs> Um, you know, or liberal, I guess. I, yeah, I mean, this is where fun makes out of that. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, I it, no, it's not gonna. I mean, George Bush ain't coming around in this story. You know, I'm just okay. not. I'm, that stuff always pains me, largely because you know these these things are going to be around 20 years from now, and when you open them up and you look at it, it's Jimmy Carter smiling, making some <laughs> peanut joke. Well, I do remember Clinton's kind of, and I don't remember the words as you do, you know, as you say too. It, it's what I remember from my memory. But seeing Clinton and Hillary commenting on Superman's death, I thought was like, oh, that's interesting. They really did pull the real world in, as opposed to President Wormwood or whoever right. Mark Wade came up well, with in Kingdom yeah. Come. <laughs> uh, yeah, again, I just think you got to be careful that stuff. I mean, I, you know, that's why I loved that it was Lex Luthor for a while. You bet. I sort of, you know, I think that's what it ought to be. Now you can't do that stuff in in, in the Marvel universe because they'll just slap you down. Uh, uh, President Fisk, Wilson Fisk. Yeah, exactly. They just look at you like, "Wait, well, you any mind?" <laughs> um, and then you know, and over in the Ultimate Universe, they really won't let you do that. Um, right. But, you know, my feeling when when we made Lex president was, how many stories do you do with the real president? So, guys, let's not, you know, suddenly have President Lex turning up in Manhunter, because uh, it's just ridiculous. Uh, and I I think we sort of fell somewhere in the middle. I, I, we may not have used him as much as we should have, and, and uh, we certainly didn't overuse him, which I was being very cautious about. Uh, so, you know, uh, the other thing is that, that this story... Uh, all takes place relatively quickly, and so I really wanted to focus on the characters who are the leads in Fallen Sun. It's it's not I'm not doing you know World Without Cap. Uh, that's that's somebody else's job. Uh, this is a, these are personal stories of these characters and how they interact with what has happened. Okay. So that I don't particularly wanted to tell the story of what's going on in, quote, the real world, um, because, first of all, I, I think that's Brubaker's responsibility and his story. Uh, but secondly, uh, Fallen Sun was designed to help the readers enjoy and understand how Wolverine the new Avengers, Spider-Man and, and Iron Man, are dealing with this tragedy. And, it, and the, the tagline uh, that I came up with for it is, you know, Captain America has died. This is what happens next. Uh, and, and that's what it's about. Uh, it's not about whether or not the world wants to turn it into a metaphor. Uh, for the world to do. As we wrap up this conversation with Jeff Loeb, we'll touch on subjects like the Buffy Season 8 comic book series coming out from Dark Horse Comics, a series that Jeff is going to be a part of in the months ahead. We'll also get into a lengthy discussion about the current trend of major publishing-wide events that have been happening at both DC and Marvel. 
and we wrap things up with a detailed discussion about the series Heroes and what it takes to write this new breakaway hit series. I, I wanted to ask you about the Buffy comic quickly because I understand that you're going to be a part of it. And uh, I, I am. And I, is that way well, down the line? I, it, it's way down the line. Okay. Um, and I uh, to talk about it is, is very premature. Okay. But I, you know, well, what I can say is that you know I adore Josh, uh, and I would, you know, I mean, we spent two years trying to get Buffy animated off the ground, and, and you know, long, long into the night kind of conversations about everything you can imagine. Uh, and he was a friend of Sam's, and, uh, and that sort of gives you free pass anywhere in life. Uh, and he called and said he had this wacky idea to do season eight in comic form. Would I write one? And I was like, yeah, tomorrow, whatever you want. Uh, and so he, he's thoroughly energized doing this which is the most bizarre thing to be in the world, uh, because I think he's just so insanely talented. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, he, when the muse comes, you don't ask in what form uh, you're going to present your ideas. Uh, and the fact that he chose comics in order to do it is, is so validating for those of us that work in the comic book business. So it's great fun. Back to events, I'm, I'm curious, and I'm not asking you to judge Mark's specific story, but really events in general for both companies for the last couple of years. There's, there's been a, a complaint coming from fans that the actual ending of a lot of these stories isn't enough closure as compared to events from, say, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And, you know, everyone understands that, you know, with monthly stories, everything feeds into what's going to happen in 30 days, and you want people back next month. But, you know, I just wondered if you uh, felt the same way, or do you disagree, I, well, or have look, a different I, way of articulating yeah, I, mean, I, I really sort of disagree in the sense that, like, I, you know, I, Civil War, and I'm, let's go back to 10 years ago, mm -hmm. or whenever it was, when Secret Wars ended, Ben stayed on the planet. Spidey came home with the symbiote costume. I mean, those stories weren't done. She-Hulk joined the SF. What did that mean? It's a lose-lose, no matter what you do. As you're telling one of these stories, the anticipation of what the ending's going to be is so high that, of course, you're going to wind up with people who are very vocal about how they were disappointed by the ending. Mm -hmm. I felt it myself on Hush. People were very vocal that, at the end, they were like, so, Hush is Tommy, and I was, it was never a secret who Hush was, the fact that his face was covered in bandages, <laughs> and the fact that he, that Batman didn't know who it was, was a mystery, but it wasn't a mystery to the reader, I introduced him, there wasn't anybody else that he could be, Right. Um, and, <laughs> and yet people were sort of, were very vocal, you know, in that world, uh, and, and I think we have to sort of judge things properly. Um, I respect the people that go on the internet, um, but I, I think I've done a little bit of research to, to know that, you know, I, I'm, is it safe to say that, that, that in comics, Newsarama is the most popular site? Yes. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that, absolutely. Okay. So I, I look at that, and, and every single time Newsarama has a poll, which is, uh, you know, did you like the ending of Infinite Crisis? There's never more than 5,000 people who vote. Never. And let's just say, for the sake of argument, that that's actually 5,000 people, when in fact it's probably 3,000 people with people who voted multiple times. <laughs> so, but let's give it the benefit of the doubt and say it's 5,000 people. Right. Let's even say that there's 10,000 people that go to that site every day. I know where you're going, and I agree uh, with you. All I know well, is, yeah. if you're selling 400,000 copies of the book, and the people that aren't buying it are, you know, I, I said this about Hush, which is, you know, we sold 375,000 copies of the final issue. My mom didn't buy all those copies. <laughs> Jim Lee's mom didn't buy all his copies. So there's an awful lot of people out there that got to the end of that story who didn't come over to my house and burn all my comics. <laughs> so, and I, and I find this, you know, 
constantly, which is why I continually say to my friends who who are bothered by what they read on the net, that you, you can't go there. That's not an accurate depiction of how people see your writing and how people see your story. The, the two ways that you can judge that is how you feel about it yourself. Did you do the best story that you thought you could? And then secondly, as crass as it is, sales makes a difference. And if, if you're watching, as I watched on Hush, that every month the issue sold more than the previous month, something was happening. People were engaged in that story. And when I look at Civil War, you know, when, when you start talking about the fact that the first issue sold over 400,000 copies, and when you get to six and seven, they were selling more than one and two, then they've tapped into a zeitgeist. Sure. They've tapped into something that you can't explain. Now, anybody can criticize anything. Personally, I read the story. I thought it was great fun. I thought everything led to a fight between Cap and Iron Man. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was surprising that Cap did as well as he did, given the fact that you would think that Iron Man could have just, you know, basically punched him. <laughs> uh, you know, which again, I thought spoke volumes in terms of Tony's character and, and what Tony was willing to do. And even the moment where Tony said, go ahead, finish the job. I mean, I think between the way that McNiven drew it and the way that Mark wrote it, there's a moment there where Tony believes that it has gone too far. Now, that's not in the text. That's what I'm reading. And then at the end, Cap gave up, and the war's over. And I don't, I like, I sort of go, seems to me it's wrapped up pretty neatly. <laughs> uh, you know, Tony talks about what the what's going to happen in terms of the initiative and, and you know, that he's hoping for a brighter tomorrow. He's made the head of S.H.I.E.L.D. And that's it, kid. You know, <laughs> See, now, as a counterpoint... 9.50, take your popcorn and go home. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't... But, you know, for me, I thought that Jenkins actually wrapped up the story in Frontline, especially given the turn that happened in Civil War Seven. And I, and, I, and I don't mean to, you know, because well, I guess it is the event of the moment, and it is the point that people are arguing about. And I haven't appeared people make this argument. I felt that uh, the two reporters, Ben and Sally, confronting both Cap and Iron Man, had more resonance, especially the way things ended in Civil War Seven with the people stopping Cap. And it's like, let's hear it from the people why they, you know, why they did this. And then also, even more so, when they approached Tony and, you know, the two reporters and said, look, we know what you did. And it's funny because I asked Bendis this just a week ago about uh, Civil War, the confession. Would it be part of the, you know, the eventual Civil War collection? And he said, probably not. And that's why I understand what you're saying. And you're right. Cap, Cap goes away. The war ends. The movie's over. It does leave you to want, you know, to get the next trade. And that's something that, as much as I agree with you on Secret War, and I'll even say it about Crisis on Infinite Earths, the original, you know, you had the new Flash, you know, while he was about to take over. Well, certainly you'd want to follow that story. But there still still seemed to be a little bit more closure. You know, just the whole f- fact of the Golden Age Superman just kind of, you know, walking into paradise with Lois and Little Lex and... You know, that's the end of the story. And and not needing follow-ups immediately, like The Confession and like Frontline. But you see, I can go to I can go to a place which is, I have not read Frontline, and I'm satisfied. Did, so, I, spoil, did I spoil Frontline for you? I'm sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I, mean, I, know, I know what was going to happen. Okay. By the same token, like, I, I, I think that's great. I think that there should be other flavors and ways, and I, and I do kind of disagree. I do uh, with both Secret War and... And Secret War was far more of a romp than Infinite Crisis was. I mean, Infinite Crisis sure. was designed to realign the DC universe. Yes. And, I mean, you got to step back and say, hang on a second. But they, they canceled Superman after that and then rebooted the whole damn thing. That's true. Uh, and created an entirely new story for this guy that had been around for 60 years. So... I don't buy for one second that the world came to a nice, neat little button. I just think that the opportunity to be negative has never been more available. And I don't think it's just in comics. I think 
they can kill a movie in an afternoon. Oh, yeah. I think that, that you know, the number of people <laughs> who go to a baseball game to spit on the players because they make too much money. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just want to watch somebody play ball. Oh, no, Shakespeare would be, like, killed uh, on the Internet. Absolutely. Yeah, Sucks. I, mean, <laughs> uh, I like that. Um, no, you know, I hear you, man. So, like, you know, wait a minute. I, I just sat through two and a half hours, and in the end, both Romeo and Juliet die? I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> Worst sure ending guys ever. Lying. Yeah. I thought they were supposed to get together in the end. <laughs> no, and, and that's another thing, too, and I think you're right, that there were story expectations specifically about Civil War. You know, people expected the Hulk to show up. People expected Thor, the real Thor, to show up. And when those things didn't happen, I think that magnified I, some like, disappointment. I, you know, I, I think that's great. You know, people expect it. Who? What? Johnny from Minnesota <laughs> and, and, and Bob from Philadelphia, they got together and decided that's the way it should be. Um, you know, it's, I, I'm not trying to be flip about it. It's just, I just came from WonderCon. Mm -hmm. And I sat in a room with, you know, they had a spotlight on me for whatever reason. And, <laughs> and you know, there was 500 seats and this thing was packed. And I, there was no moderator, so I had no idea what was going to happen. And what happened is what happens every time I go to a convention. I've never met a smarter, more engaged, more fun group of people who want to do nothing but talk about how much they enjoy the stories that I write. And... I find that true for everybody. I, I, I just don't see it. I don't think people travel to conventions so that they can get in the face of whoever it is and say, you know, I think Civil War sucked. Um, and I don't know whether or not it's because you have to come out from the facelessness of the Internet <laughs> or whether it is because the truth is just as many people who will step in front and say, I thought it was great when they're in an environment where they feel safe to do that. Because the one thing that you, you can't deny is whenever you watch one of those message threads is that if you have a series of people who say, uh, I think Civil War is the greatest thing ever, the thread dies. There's oh, sure. anything that goes on. You oh, have yeah, four or get... five guys who post positive, and then it just stops. It's only when the guy says, well, I think everyone acted completely out of character and Reed Richards should have his head chopped off, <laughs> that you suddenly then get 15 people going, what are you talking about? You can't chop off his head. He's made out of elastic. His unstable molecules would never allow that to happen. <laughs> and, you know, 45 posts later, you're, you're going, well, look at that. Everyone's upset with the end of Civil War. I'm like, no, it's not. I'm, it looks like nine guys, you know, <laughs> decided to have an argument here. But as far as events, the only the, the two things I heard was sometimes that they feel the end is not satisfying. And the other thing is that sometimes there's event fatigue because of the way things are marketed. And it's it, it just seems like we used to have a little bit more breathing room. Like summertime was the time for events. And then we'd have the rest of the year to really kind of reflect and see what happens with events. But both companies are, you know, event to event to event. I just think that, that they always were events and that, you know, the truth is that if marketing existed in the way that it exists now, um, I don't know how anyone would have dealt with the coming black this, the, well, that's the true. creation of the Black Panther, the Silver Surfer getting his power stolen by Dr. Doom, the Inhumans introduction, the introduction of the negative zone, uh, blast start a living bomb burst, the attack of claw. There's, there's <laughs> a year in the FF. A Very true. year that happened. Very true. From FF 48 to FF 60, <laughs> there are 12 stories, each of which is are an event. So, you know, I just think that that's, if it's good, it will spawn another event. The Joker's Last Laugh was badly executed. And and was done at the behest of editorial. 
So people's stories were interrupted, and they were not happy about it. And I remember talking to, to my editor saying, so let me get this straight, I have to put Joker in this story? It, it, it's, it's my 75th issue. I mean, what are you talking about? And they were like, well, that's what has that. We need to put a little Joker's last laugh across the top. I said, well, can we just put 75th anniversary issue on it? Wouldn't that be better? <laughs> and they were like, no, 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 we've got to do this. So, you know, I said, fine. Then the Joker's going to appear at the very beginning and let Doomsday out, and that's it. And they were like, okay, fine. So that's not, that's not me being difficult. That's me trying to figure out how I'm going to try to make this work. Sure. Um, and at the end of the day, it, it, it wasn't a great idea. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I personally happen to like the way that Marvel has to approach these things, which is they create an event that exists within itself. And so you absolutely could continue reading Marvel Comics and not read House of M. You absolutely could have read Marvel Comics in the last year, uh, certainly in the X-Men group, uh, and not read Civil War. You could read the Avengers and not read Civil War. Uh, you would miss a large piece of the, of the rest of the story. But I don't know. If it's, if it's fun, people like it. Uh, and if it's not, they don't. I don't think it's things should be judged based on event fatigue or, or any of those things. I, okay. mean, I just I think if you had a really cool story, marketing's gonna get behind it and, and tell the world. Otherwise you're gonna wind up doing a really cool story that people go, Well I I didn't even know that the Hulk was coming back. I just wonder if like things like Annihilation and even some very good miniseries that Marvel had going out during Civil War might have gotten more attention. Annihilation is a great example. This is a this is a group of books that, for all intents and purposes, I, if you had done that event at DC, would have been a disaster. Um, <laughs> it just would have. You, you you couldn't. You don't have an audience at DC that will do. I mean, if if you look at the at those books that led up to Crisis, the one that that always dragged behind was the Rantanagar War. Rantanagar War. Mm-hmm. And I thought those stories were very well written and very well done, and Ivan Reese is a, is a tremendous artist. You bet he is. And I completely dug what Andy Dingle was doing on, on Adam Strange. Yeah, me too. Um, That's a great series, absolutely. But, but nobody read it. I mean, you know, five of us did and loved it. So the fact that a group of creators got together, not guys that you would say are the superstars, and and some guys who had never read written comics before, and put together this mini maxi series, and it made a blip on the radar with characters like Quasar. I mean, come on! And I'm sure there's somebody who's reading this or listening to this that's sitting around going, "Hey, buddy, uh, Quasar's like the coolest guy ever." And I'm like, "Yeah, okay, great." Um, but you know, to me, the fact that it worked at all is because there's a good story there. People came to it, and now they're going to do another one. I don't know whether or not it will do as well or not do as well, but I don't think that that story would have gotten five more readers had Civil War not been going on. Really? There are certain things that you can do that they just have a ceiling. Now, you picked the uh, weakest link, but, I mean, you really don't think, like, you know, Nova, and, I mean, and Nova certainly was... And it's, you know, in its time, an interesting property and might have that kind of resurgence if it would have been given a clearer field to kind of just breathe and say, hey, yeah, remember Nova Kids? Well, he's back. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe maybe Nova is my Quasar. Come on. Come on. What are you saying? It's like, to me, that's okay. Like, every time someone says to me, there's going to be a big Nightwing event, I go, okay, that's an oxymoron. Somewhere really? Wow. Okay. I mean, like, like he's a, it's a cool character, but he's... Either, you know, Batman Light or Big Robin. <laughs> Big and, Robin. I mean, that's what he is. <laughs> and so, you know, it's sort of like saying to me, we're going to have a Big Falcon miniseries. Oh. Okay, <laughs> let's get behind that. <laughs> uh, no disrespect you know. meant to Sam Wilson and his fans. Okay. There's, no, there's the I, disclaimer. You know, I'm just saying that, that there are certain characters, just like there are certain television shows, that 
are going to hit a ceiling. There, there, there just isn't an audience that's going to come to that. And it wouldn't matter whether or not Frank Miller and Jim Lee and Todd McFarlane all came down from the mountain and said, we're going to do Nova. Okay. I, I think everyone would go, yeah, okay, it's Nova. <laughs> uh, right. You know, it's like, it's like everyone's standing around going, oh, I can't believe how bad they messed up Firestorm. Like, that would have been the greatest book of all time. Really? Because, uh, you know, it always was, it was a good book, but he's a B character. Okay. He had a B audience. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I would have re-envisioned him the way that they re-envisioned him, but, you know, they took a chance. People are standing around you know, with Manhunter trying to figure out why Manhunter doesn't work. Why should Manhunter work? Uh, you know, you, our, our business works best when the icons are working. If you're going to try to launch a lower tier B or C character, and I, and I'm not saying that those, I'm not being critical of those characters. I'm simply saying that in terms of the impact that they've had to the readership and to the larger universe is more at a B or C level than an A character has done. Um, and, you know, and theoretically, if you look at Wolverine's first appearances, particularly in the Hulk, uh, you know, there's, there's never been a greater B or C character who managed to very quickly be reinvented in a way, but largely due to the fact that he was then brought into the X-Men and the X-Men enabled that character to grow beyond that. Um, and even so, if you stop and you look at those characters that were reintroduced by Cockrum and Ween, you know, there's never been a, there, you know, Colossus was never more popular than when he came back from the dead. That's his biggest story. You know, Nightcrawler has been, a, is a great character amongst other characters. I don't think you want to hang a monthly book on Nightcrawler. They tried. But you have a better chance of those things launching and those things working better if your top tier is working. And my feeling is that when Civil War gets people excited about Marvel Comics and gets people excited about characters like Captain America and Iron Man, which, by the way, two years ago, nobody cared. <laughs> no one cared. You could take Iron Man and throw him out a window, and people would go, eh, they just threw Iron Man out a window. Well, I think that was because of Warren and, and Adi being off schedule, honestly, because I think there was anticipation for that Iron Man book. I agree with what you're saying, though, about but, the icons. But, I mean, it's, it's anticipation or not, the, the, when you look at, at in the bigger picture of, of what Casada's editorial campaign was, which was to first come in and, and, and fix the X-Men group and make it smaller and bring in Joss Whedon and, and make that more accessible. And, and then, you know, he turned his sights on the Spider-Man books and, and brought in JMS and, and kind of refocused that in a way that that's now sort of up and running. And, and I would, I was at DC and I would run into him all the time and I would say to him, because I'm an Avengers guy, going, that's the one area you have just let fall to nothing. And he would just look at me and go, we're going to get there, we're going to get there, you're going to see. And again, you want to talk about fan reaction. I, I don't remember anybody talking about disassembled with any kind of love. And yet, somehow, Brian weathered that storm and launched New Avengers to the hue and cry of, <laughs> oh my God, Spider-Man and Wolverine are going to be in the Avengers. We might as well just pull the plug right now. We might as well just get in our cars and drive off the Brooklyn Bridge. I mean, like, guys, you know, it's comics. Let's see what happens. Absolutely. And we saw what happened. The Avengers franchise is now the number one franchise at Marvel Comics. The idea that the Avengers outsells the X-Men is mind-boggling to me. That's a fair Except point. That yeah. I always thought that's the way it should be. And now there's an opportunity for... Cap and Iron Man and Thor and those, you know, core Avengers books to get reboosted and to, you know, 
come along and have a kind of resurgence, which, you know, I'm sure everybody who's who's getting to this point right now in this interview are now going to pull their brains out. It has not happened since Heroes Were Born. <laughs> uh, and that's just a fact. I mean, you can go and you can look at all of the different permutations of those characters, but the 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 greatest impact on those characters up until Civil War, with the exception of maybe the Ultimate Universe, which I don't know that you can count, um, was Heroes Were Born. And if it had worked out and the political climate were different, uh, because that's what kills Heroes Were Born, not sales, that's what not that's interest, ask. not fan, not any of that. So politics killed that. Those books would have continued in the top ten, where they had not been for years. And and again, I don't know whether or not anything should be judged on on sales or not on sales, but I do sort of feel like it is the barometer upon which we have to see whether or not something's reaching an audience. And people ask me all the time, you know, do you feel like that you use your artists as a crutch because your stories aren't strong enough? <laughs> These are obviously very kind people. And so that's why you work with Jim Lee and Mike Turner and, and, and Joe Scott Campbell. And, okay. and, I, and I look at him and go, let me ask you something. If you had a choice between writing a script for Tom Hanks or writing a script for Joe Blow, even if Joe Blow was like a really great actor and you could make a really interesting independent film, yeah, I, I suppose. I, I just tend to write stories, first of all, to the hopefully to the strength of the artist. And secondly... I want my stories read by the greatest number of people. And so if if Jim Lee makes that happen for me, then fantastic. <laughs> At the end of the day, I still have to deliver a story. And without being critical to anybody that came after Hush, Jim hasn't seen that success. So while there are people who believe that the only reason that Hush succeeded was because Jim drew it, I think you've got to step back now and oh, take no. a look at what Jim did since then <laughs> and go, well, maybe Loeb had something to do with it, maybe. <laughs> no, um, I, I am, and I don't, I look, I'm not looking for, like, you know, somebody to hand me an award and a tissue. <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying, like, this is what I do. I just tell stories, and I tell right. them the best that I can. And I'm hoping that folks like it. And I'm hoping folks that are reading this interview aren't sitting there going, geez, what a pompous windbag. Um, because I'm not at the end of the day. All I'm doing is just looking at what all of us try to do. And I do believe that guys that are the fans of Nightwing are great, great fans. And they believe that character is better than Batman. But the greater majority of people who read comics disagree. <laughs> that doesn't mean that the people that are reading Nightwing are wrong. It just means that it's just that's the way that it is. Sure. And, you know, this is, I, Jeff Johns and I, because we share a studio office, would refer to this as the sleeper effect. And what that means is, and this is with no disrespect to Ed Rubaker, Sleeper, let me be generous, sells 12,000 copies. Yeah. Personally, I think it sells eight. If you go on a message board and you read about that, you would think that when Moses came down from the mountain and had talked to God, he brought back with him a copy of Sleeper. <laughs> it was that good. And when you look at Infinite Crisis, or you look at Civil War, or you look at Hush, and you read the criticism, you must sit there and go, oh my God, th these guys, they, they should just have, they should have just put Ed Brubaker on those stories, and they would have been the greatest stories of all time. Well, they may have been, because I think Ed's a talented fella, but the truth is, the people that are commenting on Sleeper, are buying sleeper. They're, that's right. all they're doing is buying sleeper. They don't, they're, of course they're not going to knock it. There's, why would you, if there's only selling 8,000 copies 
why would you buy the book if you're not liking it? <laughs> Whereas if you get into something like Civil War and you're selling 400,000 copies, that means there's people that are picking that up that have no idea what it is. And, and so, of course, they're going to have opinions about it. And, and I watched this happen to, to Jeff because yeah, yeah, for the crisis. he lived in a very safe world on The Flash. You know, it was a book that was selling 28,000 copies, and it went to 40,000 copies. And then it went to 50,000 copies. And everyone who wrote about him wrote about him because he is the greatest guy in the world. You bet. And wrote about The Flash and, and what Jeff was doing as though he could do no wrong. Then Jeff does Infinite Crisis, where he now is exposed to an audience that's four times the size of that. Right. Which means at least a fourth of that audience, roughly the same size of his Flash audience, now has an opportunity to say, this guy can't write his way out of a bag. Sure. And, and that's what happens as you grow. And you can't let that affect you. You sure. just need to be able to try and tell the best story and have the satisfaction and the fun that a greater number of people are reading those stories and, and are involved in it and feel so compelled that they're going to express their opinion in a comic book store, or they're going to express their opinion online, or they're going to express their opinion wherever they're going to do it. But I always find it very curious is that despite the fact that it's the worst experience they've ever had in their lives, they're buying the next issue. <laughs> well, that's what I'd say about sales, because I agree with you going in, you know, a final chapter will get huge numbers, but it's the question of are they back next month that would reflect. It's it's like boxing. You're only as good as your last fight. <clears throat> but we don't know what happens until the end result, and then the question is how are you looked on for the next fight? And the same thing would go for the next issue. And I also agree that the Internet absolutely only represents a portion of the reading audience and, and not the majority. Personally, I thought that Civil War was the best thing to happen to comics in a long time because it brought in so many people to read comics. And now there'll be more people. Um, and hopefully they'll stick around. I know that you and Tim Kring have this history going back to Teen Wolf 2. And it is oh, please. Well, let's, let's, let's not try to go there. Hey, Jason Bateman has redeemed himself. What are you talking about? You knew him when, and you can say, I saw That's it even true. then. Are you done for the season, or I guess not then? No, we we uh, we shoot. I, I would say probably until the thirteenth of April, and then uh, we get our big hiatus because uh, we're back May first. Oh, you're back! You're back shooting next season, May first. Wow. Yeah. Usually, you get between six to ten weeks, and uh, but there's so much concern about the writer strike. Oh, uh, I didn't know one was coming again. Oh my uh, god! That they want to get everybody up and going, and sure. I mean, I, the truth is. We started in May last year, but we didn't, uh, ex the exception of the guys that worked on the pilot, uh, Tim and Aaron and Joe, um, uh, you know, everybody was new. So, you know, whatever break we got, I didn't get a break because I literally left Lost and started here. Wow. So it's just been, you know, just we just keep running. It's all, you know, eventually we'll explode. <laughs> I think that's how it works. You started to say how you and, and Tim rehooked up for Heroes. I was over at Lost, and, uh, you know, we've, we've stayed in touch with each other, but, uh, you know, his, both of our career paths have kept us fairly busy, and it's hard to do that, particularly in, in this town. Um, they're always good, and we see each other, you know, maybe a couple times a year kind of thing. I have a tremendous fondness for them as a couple. He and his wife are fairly amazing to see. They're, you know, they've been married forever and are still very much in love. And yeah, given the fact that I never learned that lesson, it's kind of interesting to watch. So he called and said that he had something that he wanted to talk to me about. And I, had, I really could not have guessed in a billion years what he was going to spring on me. And uh, he said that he had some ideas to do a show about people, ordinary people that it 
developed extraordinary abilities, and he just wanted to bounce it off of me. And so we started talking, and I realized that this was not something that he had just thought about. This was something that he was fully formed in his head, and he was going to go pitch the network, and he wanted to talk before he did that. Uh, and so we met over at the treehouse and walked. And uh, people who don't know this area, first of all, nobody walks in L.A. There's a song <laughs> about it. Um, but secondly, uh, we walked from Sherman Oaks into Universal City, which is, I don't know, eight miles. I mean, all I know is, is that we, we started at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we realized it was 8 o'clock. It was starting to get dark. And so if we didn't head back, we would never return. Uh, and it's not like you can call a cab, you know, in LA. You just, all you can do is walk back. And what was extraordinary was that he knew every scene, knew almost every line of dialogue, and he certainly knew every moment. And he told me the story, and it was extraordinary to listen to. Um, and, you know, every now and then he would ask a question, or he would have, an idea, like, I remember him saying that he wanted to have uh, a car come right at one of the characters, and the character was going to lift the car up using his magnetic power, because there was steel inside a car, he had to explain that to me, <laughs> and then it was going to, he was going to turn the car over, and I said, uh, Tim, that's Magneto, <laughs> and he said to me, is that a power or a person? <laughs> He said, I said, actually, it's an interesting question. I don't think anyone has ever said, I have magneto power. Um, and he was like, well, I don't know. And, and that's when I realized that not only had he never read a comic book, or if he had, it had been 20 years, he hadn't seen any of the movies. He'd never seen an X-Men movie. He'd never seen Spider-Man. He'd never seen Superman. He'd never seen any of his movies. Okay. But what he knew instinctively, which is what... I think is the gift to the show is that it's the characters that make the difference and the power is sort of irrelevant or if it's if it's about the power you deal with the power in the same kind of way that when we talk about a character you know our first questions are is it a man or a woman and how old and is she married or not and and if she is what's that relationship like and then what does she or he do for a living and you go through all the things that you would do in order to break a character and then you start figuring out what the power would be, but the power we deal with the way that you would give a character a handicap or sure. whatever, you know, an impairment, I guess, is it's politically correct. And so, you know, in the same kind of way that Nathan can fly, it's treated in a way that if you lived your whole life and you woke up one morning and you were blind, what would you do? How would it affect your life? And you would go through all of the plausible stages, most of which begin with denial. And that's what really made it interesting, was that other than the hero character, everyone denied what was going on. Peter wanted to know what was going on, but didn't understand it, so he had the furthest journey. Hero had this really the shortest journey because he immediately embraced what it was that he wanted, and then he just wanted a quest, and the quest came to him right in the beginning. The female mechanic that only has the one appearance in the one episode mm -hmm. was great. And, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, on the one hand, she thinks it's fantastic, but, yeah, you're right, dealing with it like it's a handicap and stuff, having to play that loud music to shut the world out from her yeah. super hearing. Uh, and that's crank. Uh, you know, and that and that is one of the unkept secrets of our show, which is that unlike most shows where, as Tim described it to me, you know, when you go and get your chance and you have to staff up, uh, usually the networks give you enough money to get a, to use baseball as a metaphor, so that you've got a, a pitcher and a catcher and maybe a second baseman kind of good, and then everybody else is from the farm team, and you hope to hell that they know how to play baseball. And Tim's approach was, given the fact that shows die in two episodes, why not buy the Yankees? And he showed me the list of people that he was going after, and they were six men and women who had the ability to run their own show, and some of them had. And I looked at him and said, okay, this is either the greatest idea ever 
or when you come into the writer's room, it's going to be like that scene in a Western where you op- go to the saloon and there's <laughs> people shooting at each other and just diving off of the balcony and, you know, the chandelier comes crashing down and, you know, it's just, it's going to be the greatest disaster ever. And he was fairly confident that he could create an atmosphere where that wasn't going to happen. And, you know, the guys that are here, you know, from Jesse Alexander, who came over from Alias and Lost, Mm -hmm. uh, and Brian Fuller, who had created Wonderfalls and Dead Like Me, to Michael Green, who had run Everwood, and Jack and Bobby, and, you know, was once upon a time on a show called Smallville. Uh, And it's just amazing that this group of people could get together. Uh, and then added into that mix uh, were Armis and Foster, who are just these amazing writers who you know have worked on lots of shows and who you can give anything to, and they just do a great job. And then the the two youngest guys on our show, uh, Aaron Collide and, and Joe Pekaski. Aaron was on Crossing Jordan, and Joe worked for Tim at Crossing Jordan. And oddly enough. They became, in, in my opinion, the most important guys to the show because they understood the show out of the gate and really got what the big stories were going to be and really what the little moments were going to be. Uh, and it really just sort of instantly felt like we hit the ground running. You know, we just became a ball club. And... Tim had this other wacky idea, which is because we were so pressed for time, you normally, on a, on a, on a series, you, you normally allow the writer, you, you sit in a room and you break the story mm-hmm. uh, and you create an outline and then you give it to the writer and the writer goes away for eight or nine days and comes back with the first draft. You give him notes, he goes back, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's the way I've always worked, except when you're in, in trouble and you're behind. In this case, you... you gang write the story so that you hand out sometimes scenes and sometimes you hand out whole acts and, and you put teams together the people that have never worked together before and uh, and that was very common on Lost. Okay. Uh, and But Tim's idea was let's do it from the top because we have so many separate storylines. Maybe we could ask Jeff to write Nikki and ask Brian to write Claire and ask Jesse to write Nathan and let's see where that takes us. And we wrote the first three scripts, which are episodes two, three, and four, simultaneously. Wow. And all came back, you know, literally stayed here and sort of banged through for a few days. Because when you're only, I mean, if you think about it, some of those stories are four scenes. Yes. None of our scenes are more than two pages. So you basically, you have to write eight pages, which is a day's work. Okay. You know, it's not like you're... You have to go off and write a 50-page script. Right. Um, and our structures are so strong that you, you're not faced with, how do I make this work? You're much more faced with, how do I make these scenes work? Which, for a writer's perspective, is a much easier place to get to. And then we put them together. Now, you got to understand, this is a little bit like, you know, I'll go out and buy the eggs, and you go out and buy the flour, and you go out and buy the, the butter... And we're going to meet on Thursday and throw them in a bowl and hope that it makes a cake. And it worked. <laughs> and it was so thrilling. Like, we all sat around going, this isn't bad. This is sort of good. Uh, and, you know, because you, you, when you're a writer in Hollywood, all you ever do is just expect the Hindenburg. Sure. You know, it's just like, you know, you have all the hopes and dreams that you're going to be able to take this big, giant, fancy blimp and you're going to be able to go across the country and... <laughs> It's going to be the greatest thing ever, and see the Atlantic Ocean, and you'll have luxury seating, and it'll be fantastic. And instead, it blows up in New Jersey <laughs> uh, and over humanity. So, uh, you know, our our little show suddenly had a new way to do business. And I don't know any show that works the way that we do. Certainly not a one-hour drama. Um, and we kept it, and we have this ability to be able to to break a story very quickly, uh, hand out the scenes. Generally, people stay here. We work for a few days, put it back together again, and then give it to the writer of record. And then it's his or her's responsibility to walk it all the way through 
through production, okay. through editing, through everything. And that was the other big draw for me. Um, you know, the, the piece that I left out was that, you know, two months later, Tim called and said, I have a pilot. Would you come over and take a look at it? And I went over to his office at Crossing Jordan. And he put me in this little tiny room with this big, giant television set. I literally was like five inches away from the screen because the room was so small. And uh, and I was devastated. I mean, like I, at the end of it, I was just I was just about crying because it was so overwhelming how emotional the stories were. Uh, and I came into his office and he was like, well, what do you think? And I said, I start Monday morning. Cool. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I'm starting Monday morning. <laughs> and he said, you're working on Lost. I said, I don't care. Let's work it out. I have to be part of this. Uh, and then we spent a couple hours talking about, you know, where I could fit in and what would happen. And, uh, and, and the, the real concern about our friendship and what it would be like to have somebody that's a friend working on the show. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, you know, I took the same approach that I take to everything, which is, look, if it doesn't work, I'll quit. It's not a big deal. Uh, and it worked. Uh, and I, I, given the calamity that my life is, to find, uh, this show at this time, while I, I would have loved to have shared it with my son, because he would have gotten the biggest kick out of it. Yeah. It gave me a place to go. And I'm here most of the time. Uh, you know, I'm here right now at 7 o'clock in the morning, and, you know, I won't go home until 9 o'clock. And there's, what's amazing about television is there's always something to do. There's a set. There's a writer's room. There's a there's post-production. There's casting. There's something to do. You just need to go to it. Um, and the way our show works is if what you want to do is sit in your office and write, that's great. Sit in your office and write. If what you want to do is go to the set, go to the set. If what you want to do is just hang out and post, go. Do it. Just do it with passion. Uh, and that's what Tim like to inspire people. So are you still following one character or do you guys switch off? No, no, no. We, we, uh, we very much switch off. Okay. And, and that's actually the challenge and the fun of the show. I began writing a lot of Nikki stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you bounce around all over the place and um, there's just certain guys I, you know, I really like. I, you know, of late I've been writing a lot of Matt, a police officer. Okay. Um, I like Greg's voice a lot. He really is great. I loved him on Alias, and he's yeah. fantastic on us, yeah. too. He's, he's, he's the, the ambassador of the world, as I like to refer to. <laughs> you can send him to anything, and, and people go, you're great. <laughs> uh, he just cracks me up. We met in uh, Orlando, the cheerleader and uh, Siler. They were... uh, Hayden and Zach, yeah. You know, Zach came to the show very late. If you look at the first three or four episodes, you know, people thought that we were being clever and that we were hiding his identity because it was going to be ooh, Nathan or somebody. And the truth was, we hadn't cast him yet. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I mean, we, we wanted him to be a dark, mysterious figure, and you don't want to hire an actor and have him not talk or do anything. Um, and so, you know, we knew exactly when he was going to appear. We knew that when uh, we did the cheerleader story that he was going to have to have a face at that point. Uh, and, you know, we saw a lot of people, and Zach just came in and had this sort of very quiet intensity to him. Uh, and, you know, I think in a lot of people's minds, we were going to cast somebody that was like a big, giant, you know, serial killer kind of guy. <laughs> and then that, we, you know, he's fairly slight and uh, very soft spoken, but, man, he's scary as hell. Oh, yeah. Um, but not in real life. You know, in real life, he's the sweetest <laughs> guy in the world. Um, and uh, Hayden is just nothing short of remarkable. I mean, she's been acting since she was a baby, literally. Uh, she's turned 17 uh, during this season. Wow. Uh, playing a 16-year-old. And her level of emotion and depth is extraordinary. And when you see her cry on screen... Those, those aren't fake tears. She can she can bring that out. Wow. Uh, 
and can do a take after take. And what really makes her extraordinary is when you do a shot, which is over the shoulder, so that the camera is on, like her father, right. her G, uh, Bennett. And, uh, you know, sometimes the actor, when you're shooting over the shoulder, you know, just gives a reading. It's not that big a deal. And, and so the actor who's facing camera is forced to try to make a performance out of something that's not necessarily the person that they're acting with is very strong because they're saving it for their side. And Hayden doesn't do that. Hayden just gives it to you. And so she'll cry on every take, even when she's not on camera. Wow. Um, and it's just incredibly helpful to the actors that they're working with. Um, you know, in, in an odd way, you know, she's one of the most professional people I've ever worked with, uh, even though she's... I love all the, uh, the the people that you're bringing in, like Eric Roberts and George Takai and, uh, you know, Richard Roundtree is coming up, I hear, and, you know, that's that's great, and that's certainly, I think, uh, any person who's a fan of this kind of genre is, like, thrilled when these people do walk on, so the casting is amazing as well. Plus the, the regulars, and it was, I never realized that uh, Bennett was Stephen on Dynasty. He was, he was, he was Steve Carrington. And he tells stories of that of those days because he was a young guy, you sure, know, and he was a young, handsome guy. Oh, he looked like Sting. I remember and, it well, absolutely. And, you know, <laughs> but he played gay on the show. Yes, so, he did. <laughs> and you know, in those days, there was only three networks. There was no cable. There was no alternatives. You either watched ABC, CBS, or NBC. Right. And so he would talk about how, you know, on a bad night, they would have fifty to sixty million viewers. <laughs> uh, and so, no, he couldn't go anywhere without people recognizing him but they thought he was gay sure so, sure like all you know this is a young man's opportunity to conquest anything uh and his opportunities are limited um uh, which is so if you knew jack it's just so jack's life um except that you know now he has this insanely beautiful wife and insanely beautiful daughter and, uh, that's cool <laughs> uh they're just great they're great people um i know it all sounds like you know uh, is, isn't Jeff Loeb so full of it uh, that it could be that much fun over there? Because every, particularly a first year show, if you look at any first year show, there's usually at the end of the year mass firing. Sure. Um, and it isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's because if you stop and you think about it, particularly on your writer staff, you're you're trying to find the show. Absolutely. And when the sh- and when it's an original idea, it's generally in the head of the creator, and so that person you know finds two people. Um, that are able to sort of figure it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the end of the day, in the second season, you have a much better sense. And if you have two people that have figured it out, they know two people. So then you start building your staff out from there. And that's what happened on Smallville. Smallville fired everybody in the first year except for one or two people. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Lost. And, you know, and so when people <laughs> called us to say, you know, who are you get rid of, they were like, uh, Probably nobody. <laughs> kind of like everybody here. That's cool. Um, and uh, and that's again, I, you know, I think just speaks volumes about Craig, uh, and and what he's trying to do here. You know, I mean, we really are trying to make a better mousetrap. Sure. Um, you know, when you have people that have had as much experience. As you sort of have a why not attitude. What's the you know what works? You've come from it. Why not try to see whether or not you can push the envelope out a little farther and maybe create a new model? Mm-hmm. Um, but you can't do that without a guy like Crank because uh, Tim's natural instinct uh, is to throw people in the deep end and see whether or not they can swim. And if you can't swim, it's okay. He'll know not to throw you in the deep end. It's not as though you then get fired. Um, he'll find where you can swim and make sure that, that you do well there. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of guys, you know, again, I, you know, I've heard him say it a billion times. Um, he's done this for so long. Uh, and, and when I say for so long, you know, I don't want to make it sound like he's an old guy. I mean, <laughs> uh, but he's been in television for 20 years and, uh, and started young. So, but his attitude is is that there's more than enough credit to go around. And when you inspire people and you don't hide the fact that you're a team show and you don't need to be that person who's out in front, uh, 
and continually remind everybody that the only reason why they have a job is because of you, uh, or that you desperately need to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, it just creates a different atmosphere, and and Tim doesn't foster that in any way. I mean, instead, he fosters the exact opposite, which is he wants everybody else to be the smartest people in the room, uh, which really empowers your staff, and then empowers and turns your scripts and that empowers your crew and and you know whether or not we knew whether or not it was going to be a hit the one thing that I knew that was odd was that I would walk down on set this is before we ever aired okay. and we had seven episodes in the can when the first episode aired wow so we've been shooting for months and I would walk down on set and the people in hair and makeup the drivers the of the electricians would stop me and say, what's the next script? <laughs> and I'd be like, uh, is that because you need to know how many lights we're getting? <laughs> and they would look at me like, no, 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 I, I want to know what happens. <laughs> and I'd be like, are you kidding me? Like, we're just telling the stories. It's okay. You'll get us. No, 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 I want to know. <laughs> um, and so I think we all experienced the same thing, which was if we could get an audience to come, then they would stay, and we'd see what happens. You, you, we're seeing now with law some people, and I don't, you know, again, I don't know, and I don't mean to like give credence to the internet, but it just seems in general because I know ratings are down on loss. Where some people are like they're not giving enough clues, and when you're in a show like this that is doing something innovative and is dealing with clues, is that something you can maintain? I mean, there are White House shows, you know, that were White Hot two years ago, like something like Desperate Housewives that, you know, really have kind of cooled off and everything. Well, I, I mean, I think Housewives hasn't. Um, I actually think Housewives is sort of extraordinary in the fact that their second season took a dip, and they, they decided to come out and say, yeah, we know. Come back, and we'll show you that we really know what we're doing. And okay. they did, and it worked, um, which I thought was sort of amazing. Um, look, we made a conscious effort. We looked at, at what some of the other shows were doing and decided that... We would probably not let things go for more than three episodes before we explain what happened. Okay. Um, and that's it's not a policy, but we try to sort of look at it and go, how do we do this and and reveal those things along the way and and yet keep enough balls in the air that the audience is still compelled to come back. Uh, and certain things that we could have never guessed were going to work uh, are sort of staples of the form, and yet it works. And that's, you know, our Act 5, uh, which, you know, is the last part of the show, mm-hmm. um, you know, became this, you know, the marketing department picked up on it and, you know, it said, and be prepared for a hero's cliffhanger, the likes of which you've never seen. <laughs> And we were like, that was like the second show. And we were like, okay, now they're called Heroes Cliffhangers. I didn't know that it was a, it was a trademark. Uh, but we embraced it and, and figured out, you know, it didn't matter which character you were involved with. At least one of those characters was going to have an ending that when it came up to be continued, that we hoped that we had earned it. Sure. Um, and I remember on one of the early shows, just as a mistake in post, we left it off. And people were like, wrote in, like, what happened to it to be continued? <laughs> and we were like, okay, we need to put that back on the show. We didn't realize that was a character, too. Um, <laughs> just the title card that says to be continued. Exactly. Oh, my God. <laughs> in the Tim Sale font. Um, so it's just, you know, it's one of those things where... You don't try to mess with success, and we've been very careful uh, to continue to widen the story, but at the same token, tighten things up. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that the you know last five episodes are very satisfying. It's always hard when you're burning as hot and white as we are uh, to uh, guess. What do you think is going to happen? It's the top new show, isn't it, of the season? Yeah, it's the, it's the most popular new show. That's crazy. Uh, oh, it's absolutely insane. I mean, like, you could never 
I mean, somebody has to be. Sure. Uh, but <laughs> you you don't ever expect that it's going to be you. But Well, this could have been misfits of science. It, it could have been. <laughs> you know? um, unfortunately, there's not enough good misfits of science. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Crane... And, and and all of us talked about that it was it, it could only be one of two things. Either the Hindenburg or the or the greatest thing ever. There was no it was not a show that was gonna land in the gray. Yeah. Um, and people were either going to embrace the fact that there were ordinary people who had extraordinary abilities and and were and we were gonna tap into whatever that zeitgeist is that makes Spider Man this giant thing. I, uh, you know, I mean, if you if you look at the top ten movies, yeah, uh, with the exception of Titanic, and you could make an argument that Titanic is also fantasy, they're all fantasy driven stories. Yep, uh, and there's something to that. You know, it it isn't. You know, people want to poo poo it and say, well, that's just a lot of fourteen year old boys that are going to the movies a billion times. <laughs> and you want to go, no, that wouldn't work every time and through two generations. Yep. Um. Uh, there's just something to it, and there's something about the ability to be able to tell stories through metaphor that is very exciting to the human spirit. Um, and uh, and you know, again, at its core, what Heroes says to the audience is: these are difficult times, but don't worry. One of us, and it could be you, will rise up, and. And it doesn't matter whether or not, and I'm trying not to get lofty about it, but it doesn't matter whether or not it's Jesus or Buddha or Gandhi or Superman. It, that kind of feeling uh, that a single individual can make a difference in a time when it just sort of feels like there's a lot of things going on that are out of our control mm-hmm. is a very warming experience. And... You can't predict what's going to happen. I mean, I have to tell you, I, I saw the kidnap pilot, and I just thought it was great. I thought it was well written. I thought the acting was really strong. I loved the the New York of it all, and I really strongly, you know, considered going on that show because um, it just looked like it was going to be the next big thing. And when it didn't work, people immediately said, well, of course it didn't work. Nobody wants to see a show where a guy gets kidnapped. And I was like, okay, well, I I did. But you could tell that the sort of the anxiety of it, the anxiety of of the nine, which is nine people are held hostage in a bank. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't want to watch that. I don't want to be part of that. Right. Um, Why share in someone's misery? Or the after effects of, of how exactly. it's, you know, and, yeah. And so it's it's just a very odd experience. That's cool. You had said before that your role in Lost was to not only write, you know, individual stories, but also to kind of help break the stories and, and come up with, you know, scenes. And, and it seemed like, you know, kind of fill out scripts and things like that. Is is this a similar role in Heroes, or are you... You know, I, you've explained that you're 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 writing one specific character, but are no, you in I mean, the room? I, but, or are you... you know, I've I've, I've had two episodes and, mm-hmm. and uh, where you know I've gone all the way with them. And but the, I think the main thrust difference is that both on Smallville and on uh, Lost, I was essentially what I affectionately refer to as the room monkey, mm-hmm. uh, meaning I, I stayed in the writer's room ninety percent of the time. Uh, which meant all of my skills uh, as a producer, as someone that would be on set, to deal with the actual physically making the show, from casting to post, uh, were being held in check. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was one of the big driving things that got me here. Uh, and uh, Jesse Alexander, uh, who's my partner in crime here, um, and I sat down at the very beginning, and I said to him, "Look, you know, I, I just, I can't be the room monkey. I'm sorry. I, I love breaking story, and I love writing, and I'll give you 100. percent But I, I just can't be in there all the time." And he looked at me and he said, "Dude, I hate going to set. <laughs> so if you'll be the set bitch, I'll be the room monkey." Uh, 
and that was sort of you know it and it's not that cut and dried um because we all swim in each other's cesspool mm-hmm. um but it's we've pretty much found ways of of helping each other out and working to each other's strengths and it it really is in you know that baseball metaphor was never stronger and and the idea is that you know could a second baseman play third base absolutely could a guy in right field pitch he might um and but we've all sort of found our our areas and i like moving around uh, and i like being in, in all different departments at all times uh it just keeps me busy do you see a day where you'd be running a show and you know might do this down the road you mean something I've created? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it, and that was the original plan. I mean, I, you know, I, I when I first started out, you know, that's what I was doing. I was doing pilots, and, uh, and so when they asked me to go on Smallville, my agent called me and said, "You know, you've you've only been a general. Do you know how to be a soldier?" And I was like, "I don't know." I mean, you're right. I've only been a general, so. Let's go find out. I mean, if it's a disaster, I'll quit. It's not, you know, again, it's not, I don't live in a world that's driven by fear. I live in a world that's driven by fun. And if it's not fun, then goodbye. <laughs> um, and that's sometimes very frustrating to people who want to drive you by fear. And I I think you find that in, in every business. You know, I'm sure that those guys that are working at Home Depot that are miserable because their bosses are just continually looking at them going, I'll fire you tomorrow. If what you do is is you make it very clear to them, go ahead. <laughs> I'll find a job on Thursday. Sure. Um, they find that they don't have anything to hold over you anymore. And you can do your work. Uh, and I, I find that in comics as well. You know, I mean, the, the threat that you'll never work in this business again um, is my own threat. You know, it, it the only thing that I ever am concerned about is that I'm going to hit a patch where I start telling stories and people go, eh, I don't want to read your stories anymore. And it happens to everybody. Um, you know, I mean, my my heroes are, you know, Mike Ween and Jerry Conway and Roy Thomas and Elliot Magan. And, uh, you know, these are guys that, that eventually got to a place where they weren't the guys to go to anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, I'm sure they've got great stories to tell. Uh, so there'll come a time when Brian Dennis and Mark Miller, Jeff Loeb, or remember when they used to tell good stories. <laughs> uh, and I'm hoping, you know, John and I have we have a mutual suicide pact, which is when <laughs> when one of us starts telling a really bad story or realizes that that it's gone, that the magic has left, that. I go in and shoot him in the head, and then I go home. So it's not really mutual. At least we know that one of us is not going to be writing anymore. (laughs) There's our blackout. Thanks a lot, man. This has been great. And as always, you provide very interesting insights, and and, uh, your perspective is always uh, a welcome listen. So uh, I, I thank you, and I know my listeners will thank you as well. Word Balloon is brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Look. Aftershock has been a longtime sponsor of Word Balloon. It's greatly appreciated, but also I love the fact that they give so many friends of Word Balloon the opportunity to make great new original books, like There's Something Wrong with Patrick Todd from Ed Brisson and Gavin Guidry. That series debuts this month from Aftershock Comics. There's also Astronaut Down from James Patrick and Rubin, uh, also debuting this month. Ron Mars and Marcos Castillo brought us Almost American. The complete series is now collected, and uh, that trade paperback has also dropped from Aftershock Comics. Also, Cullen Bunn and Heath Amodio bring a brand new story to Aftershock the Heathens. As you know, Cullen's been a great Aftershock creator. Lots of great supernatural and crime stuff from Cullen and other genres as well. That's the great thing about Aftershock Comics. So many great genres beyond superhero stories. Not that they ignore superheroes, but really give you a full breadth of uh, genre fiction in all accounts. Whether it's western, sci-fi, supernatural, crime, horror, everything. You can find it at Aftershock Comics. Go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages of art, and the diamond codes on how to order these books through your local shop at aftershockcomics.com. 
This episode of Word Balloon is brought to you by AlexRossArt.com. Coming up in the later part of the summer or early fall, from Abrams and Marvel, it's Fantastic Four, Full Circle, written and illustrated by Alex Ross. It's a rainy night in Manhattan. Not a creature is stirring except for the thing, Ben Grimm. When an intruder suddenly appears inside the Baxter building, the Fantastic Four find themselves surrounded by a swarm of invading parasites. These creatures composed of negative energy come to Earth using a human host as a delivery system, but why? Fantastic Four has no choice but to journey into the negative zone. Great story, uh, great creator, as you know, Alex Ross. uh, Really excited for this project. He's been working on it for a really long time. And, uh, man, you are in for some spectacular images. And if you want to get a preview for this, all you need to do is go to Alex's website, alexrossart.com. It's there also, as always, amazing paintings, uh, sketches, lithographs, posters, every price point, epic images. You know the name. Check it out, alexrossart.com. Word Balloon is brought to you by my listeners. You are the sponsors of Word Balloon, the League of Word Balloon listeners, via subscriptions monthly to Patreon, patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Hey, couldn't do it without you, honestly, League. I I truly appreciate your support. I appreciate your devotion, your listenership, and your patronage, honestly. Um, You know, if you can even spare a dollar a month, it's greatly appreciated. It helps me make these terrific shows, uh, go to conventions where I'm not sponsored, and, uh, you know, keep networking and and, uh, making interesting programming, hopefully for you to enjoy every month here on Word Balloon. But I couldn't do it without you. Thank you very much. League of Word Balloon listeners. Again, if you want to subscribe to Word Balloon uh, for as little as a dollar a month, all you need to do is go to patreon.com slash word balloon, W-O-R-D-B-A-L-L-O-O-N. And again, I really appreciate your patronage, subscription, and attention, all of you, the League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is brought to you by Aw Yeah Comics. You know the imprint, you know the stores. There's three locations for Aw Yeah Comics in suburban Chicago, Skokie, Illinois, in New York, in Harrison, New York, and in Indiana, in Muncie, Indiana. All three stores have a big online presence. They have Facebook groups and they do live online sales every week and give you reviews of the latest books. So make sure you go to their website, awyeahcomics.com slash our locations, and it will give you the links. Oh Yeah Comics, a great resource to find new books and pick up your old favorites as well. Make sure you head to their website, awyeahcomics.com, and go to those locations and make sure you watch those online auctions they have every week. Until next time, thanks a lot for listening. Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2022. Stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy.